Welcome to another edition of the Liberty Advisor Show. This is another on-location interview that we have with, with Ian Freeman, who is the host of Free Talk Live on LRN.FM, where he is the program director. Now, I also made the mistake again in this one, because it was back-to-back videos where did the same thing with John Snyson, did the same thing with Ian Freeman, unfortunately, where the audio is picking up from the camera itself and not from the actual microphone. So I do apologize for the quality. But Ian is, uh, you know, an OG in the in the Liberty movement, actually OG in the crypto movement as well. So in this video, you get to see actually the story of how Roger Veer, who's also known as Bitcoin Jesus, how he discovered Bitcoin through LRN.FM and through Ian, and then how it was Roger who then got Ian to start accepting Bitcoin. And really, it's a great, uh, you know, full circle story of how one of the biggest figures in crypto, how he came to find out about crypto was through the man I'm about to interview right now. So hope you guys enjoy. You also have been around, obviously, the Liberty space for a very long time. Very influential person in the, I don't want to call it a movement, but in the greater Liberty uh, sphere. And how would you compare Eric Boko to other events? Or, because other events, like I guess you call Pork Fest, you know, started off as one thing, maybe it evolved or evolved into something else. And where do you think kind of this event really kind of ranks with different, I guess, Liberty events around the, around the country that you've been to? Well, did you know that, do you want me to hold it or should you hold it? I'm not used to it. Um, did, did you want me to, uh, did you know that I wrote an article about this? Because I did last year, uh, after in Arthur 2018, I said, this is the event uh, that is the must attend event. It's taken the, t- the title from Pork Fest. And Pork Fest is the summertime camping festival that the Free State Project puts on. And Pork Fest is a great event, no doubt. Um, but Pork Fest kind of hit its peak several years ago. And uh, this event, I don't know if it's hit its peak yet. Um, this one didn't sell out. Last year's did, but this year they rented the entire hotel. So it's a much larger space now. And so they've got still some room to grow here at, uh, at Anarchapulco. I, I heard from the organizer this morning that there were uh, about 2,500 attendees here this weekend. So that's very, very good. It's up from about 1,700 last year. But it's not about the numbers. It's about the experience. It's about the people. It's about the vibe. It's about you know what you're doing here and are you enjoying yourself. It's not also just about the speakers either. Because like some people come, they want to see Ron Paul. And that's great. Ron Paul's awesome. And, uh, and everybody was raving about him last night. But it's about the people that you connect with. It's about the networking. And it's just an easygoing uh, group. I've really enjoyed Anarchapulco. I think it is truly the uh, must-attend Liberty event. If you're only going to attend one of them, and there are a lot of good ones, this is the one. I actually did know about that saying and the quote that you had, but I was trying to kind of throw you a softball. But now you, now you called me out on it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But anyways, I mean, you, you see the types of people are here and the networking that's able to get done here. And it really is just an awesome atmosphere where you don't have to explain to anybody what the Federal Reserve is. You don't have to explain to anybody how this whole matrix works. And the fact that, you know, we have, you know, a little bit more people here this year than last year is really quite amazing considering all the, you know, the tourists you saw in the crypto space in 2017 when everything shot to the moon. And now they're, uh, I've been to other com- crypto conferences recently and you get to see major, major speakers in ballrooms that could fit 2,500 people. And there's like... You know, ten people watching Jeffrey Tucker speak, and there's you know fifty people watching Brock Pierce speak, and there's really, and it's actually it's quite, a, it's quite, a, you know, there's more people here watching me speak as a nobody of like, <laughs> hey, I was just too lazy to get up and just got captivated by attention than these mega superstars and some of these other. Uh, now this isn't only a crypto conference; it's uh, it's Liberty as well, and uh, no. <clears throat> But, but it's mostly a crypto conference. I mean, I, ch- I shouldn't say it's mostly. There's more than just crypto here, but it feels like a crypto conference. At least to me it does. And maybe it's because I'm sitting right outside the crypto room. Because there's different stages here. Uh, there's the main stage, this direction. There's the crypto stage. And there's like two or three other you know, different types of like family conference. And then there's you know, all kinds of things happening here. So they've really, that's another way this conference has expanded. Last year was just the main stage and that was it. And now there's like four different or five different things going on simultaneously. So you can't see everything. That is one of the things where it's kind of turning into this festival where you can't, you got to pick and choose of, hey, you know, there's all these great things. Uh, and after a while, if you're in it, as long as, you know, somebody like yourself is, it's probably more about the networking and just seeing your friends and people that you get to interview. Because a lot of the speeches, if you're really into it, I mean, if you've seen Ron Paul speak, you know, a thousand times and, you know, you look at, you know, hundreds of thousands of different videos. I mean, how, I mean, what can you really gain? Yeah. I mean, I, I tend to come at it with that same attitude, um, but then, like I said, I've been in the Liberty Movement for more than 
a decade, two decades now at this point. Um, but there's still newbies, right? Like even though you said, yeah, you don't need to talk to everybody about the Federal Reserve, I did meet a guy who yesterday who said that he just came across a Jeff Berwick video two months ago, and like he had never seen any of this stuff. Before. So even though you know that's probably true of 90% of the people here, there's still a bunch of people here that are brand new, and uh, so those are the kind of people they need to see the speakers, they need to hear the ideas of liberty and freedom and volunteerism and, and there's no doubt there that's in it's, it's plenty there's a lot of that here so you can get a lot of that information now this is a question that's seen you pose to a lot of other people so now you're on the other side of this but what really brought you into the whole liberty movement and it's funny because yesterday we had talked and you actually left the libertarian party basically yeah. right before i had gotten in right. well, gotten in and out for the you know first of several times uh it depends when they pissed me off but Right now, uh, you know, I guess yeah, we got all the Bill Weld stuff, and we don't need to get into that. But what really got you into all of this? What was? Is there any one moment, or is it a combination of moments? Um, I, I would have to say it was smoking marijuana for the first time um, when I was 16. Obviously, that didn't lead me to you know any kind of movement necessarily, but that was the first step um, when I really kind of learned that the government had lied to me. You know, Dare class where they taught you that marijuana was the same as heroin. And, and all these other dangerous drugs, um, and then I find out, oh wait, no, they didn't tell me the truth about that. Huh, I wonder what else they're lying to me about. Turns out almost everything. Um, and, so, and heroin, yeah. I think, is only a Schedule Two drug, whereas marijuana right. is Schedule One, so actually it's more dangerous. That's their claim, is that mar marijuana has no medical perceived benefit, and of course it's total BS. So uh, that was, for me, an, a real eye-opening experience, and then from there I somehow found the Libertarian Party's presidential candidate in 1998, his name was Harry Brown, back when the Libertarian Party actually had real uh, candidates who, I mean, the other ones are real, but ones that were principled, ones that actually understood what liberty is, ones that understood the non-aggression principle and communicated it every opportunity. I mean, if you've never seen Harry Brown, he's, he's passed away for like a decade now, but man, he really was a great communicator of these ideas, and I'm so glad that he was the one that brought me in instead of somebody like Gary Johnson or Bill Wells. Yeah, and that really, he brought up a great point with, uh, with the whole marijuana issue, and that is an issue that I think is... It, I mean, there's so many conservatives who just miss the boat on this issue. I mean, first off, if you want, you, you, there's no freedom, but it's either you have freedom or you don't have freedom. And then uh, I read a book. I, I'm trying to think of the title. I believe it was uh, called uh, "The Emperor Wears No Clothes." And yeah, Jack it, Herr. It, yep, Jack Herr. And uh, a lot of people don't realize that they see the marijuana strain in Jack Herr and don't really realize the whole, uh, is, the whole other inside baseball in that. Actually, I ended up doing a whole presentation where I had a teacher who said you can do any presentation you want except for on one on marijuana. Really? So I did one on hemp, and I ended up getting a zero. Ended up getting a zero on it. It was like twenty percent of my grade. But yeah, it was because of that book. And what they, one of the points that they brought up, and this is so crucial to what you were uh, talking about, is if you think that, hey, I've been told that, you know, uh, you go back to the congressional record, and it was that, you know, white women were getting raped by black guys, or yeah. one person was taking, Johnny was taking a hit off of it. And next thing, he, he was murdering his family with an axe. They made a movie about that. And then you realize, and then I think that's the lies actually create the gateway to the other drugs. And then you think, yeah. oh, well, maybe fentanyl is not that bad, or maybe right. meth isn't that bad. Yeah. And so it's, and as you're just honest with people, because you know there are some people who probably shouldn't be smoking weed, and they're probably that are lazy. But you know what? They would probably be getting into something whether you tried it or not. And we also just came out. I'm not sure if you saw this, but yesterday Donald Trump actually came out and said that uh, he would like to take China's approach and potentially execute drug dealers. In case the in case the wall that has the slats in the middle, which you know obviously you can't find any way to pass drugs through a slat or with a drone or the other 99 just, just when I'm starting to like Donald Trump like he was growing on me and now all of a sudden he wants to do death penalty for drug dealers it's terrible he was imitating uh, President Xi out of China or the dictator Xi out of China and saying you know uh, and I went to him and said you guys don't really have too much of a drug problem here why is that and I thought it's because they execute the drug dealers and so and there's one thing maybe he's executing the ones bringing it in like the CIA but, yeah, that's not good. Enough. That's terrible. I'm sorry to hear that uh, Trump said that. So uh, it doesn't work. I mean, you can, you can. We, we've certainly seen plenty of studies over the years that show that punitive uh, sentences don't actually decrease crime. You know, if you're going to put, if you're going to put a murderer to death, or you're going to put him in prison for you know 20 years, neither of those things is going to factor into uh, whether or not the the act is actually committed. Uh, drugs aren't going to go away. They're going to just be distributed by the more dangerous characters. So if your marijuana dealer right now is a nice hippie kid, 
uh, well, maybe the hippie kid's going to be scared into not selling the weed because of the death penalty, but then some badass biker might come in and start doing it instead and make the make the business of selling marijuana even more dangerous or whatever other drug, you know, heroin or cocaine or whatever. So it, as you increase the penalties, you increase the uh, sort of the badassery of the people that are, who are involved in that, that business. It's the people who are willing to risk death. You know, those are the, the real scary folks. And it's funny because you see all the conservatives who want to stand with the police, who want to stand no matter what. And yet, if you actually cared about police officers' lives, you wanted to have less police officers die, you would actually legalize the drugs because then it would then, you know, if you, you know, you're a black guy and you've already been pulled over twice or something and you realize, hey, if I get caught with this again, I'm going to be thrown in jail the rest of my life. Well, then you're going to have that very high incentive to do anything at all costs to get away from that right. person trying to oppress you. And it really is sort of this modern day uh, slavery system. But getting back to your journey to liberty, so you then, uh, you know, I think you started down in Florida, ended up in New Hampshire, and you are really pretty much one of the OGs of the Free State Project, which now is, that's a whole other subject. But uh, how did you end up in New Hampshire and how were you uh, the first, one of the first people to move there or were you the person that was trying to get people to move there initially or how did you how did that all come about i was moving over 420 actually. and that uh, was not scripted i did not no, know, yeah, that, so. yeah, know that um and i technically I, they, they've got two different ways of measuring it so mover 420 includes the people who were already in the state so when the free state project started for those that don't know it's a migration of libertarians to move to new hampshire um when the free state project started they had 10 states that they were considering. And so there was a vote. So once they hit 5,000 members, 5,000 signers, 5,000 people who said, I'm willing to move for freedom. Uh, where are we gonna go to? Well, let's vote. So when New Hampshire won, there were already like a couple hundred people who were in New Hampshire because you know, they didn't know where it was gonna be, so they'd signed up saying they were willing to move elsewhere. So the people who were already there were counted as the first couple hundred movers, even though they didn't move. So that's where the 420 number came from. Uh, as far as actual people who moved on like 150 or something like that, something like that right? um, but uh, how did I find that concept? Well, in 2001, that idea was uh, was put forth. I probably found it in around 2002 uh, on the internet somehow. You know, libertarians on the internet were there, and uh, and I thought as soon as I heard it, I thought, wow, it's a really good idea because libertarians can't get a foothold anywhere. Um, they're a very small portion of any given population anywhere in the world, and so whenever they run candidates. Candidates, they do nothing, you know, 2%, if they're lucky, 3% in a three-way race or whatever. And so you just, they couldn't get any kind of traction. And, you know, we've worked hard, libertarians have, and it just, you don't get anywhere. Working so, hard to leave you alone. Right. And uh, it's, it's frustrating, and it, and it creates burnout. And, you know, people that have worked hard on these campaigns and doing you know, activism, they all get burned out eventually, and then they call it quits. And so how do we stop that from happening? How do we get traction? How do we grow this movement? Um, the idea is come together, like have an, in, an intentional migration of people to come to the same place. And I thought, as soon as I heard that, I'm like, yeah, that's a brilliant idea. I don't want to be cold. I don't want to move to a cold place because I'm from Florida originally. And, you know, you can see how skinny I am. I'm super skinny. I get cold easy. And so it took me a while to really kind of come to grips with the idea of, okay, well, maybe it's worth it to be cold if I'm actually going to have a chance at being more free. And uh, so I got over the fear of, of the cold and I signed up for the Free State Project. And, um, and then the vote happened and New Hampshire won overwhelmingly in the vote because there's just so many reasons why. It's a great documentary film actually called 101 Reasons Liberty Lives in New Hampshire. It's an hour-long documentary, which I helped co-produce at 101reasonsfilm.com. It goes through some really persuasive reasons. So anyway, they had this, at the time it wasn't a movie. At the time it was just a text list of reasons why. It was like, wow, it was really persuasive. Um, New Hampshire's an amazing, already very free place compared to the other states. It's got a good head start, no income tax, no sales tax, and a bunch of stuff there. And uh, so it was a great starting point from which we can build a real movement of libertarians. And it's been working. There have been uh, thousands of people, a couple thousand at least, who've moved already, and they've you know, spread out throughout the state to go to the best place for them, wherever they can find work or wherever they like or whatever. And, uh, and having that concentration is what makes a difference. You know, if you've got enough people in one area who are talking about freedom, then the average person, Joe, Joe Sixpacks or whoever, is more likely to encounter you. 
Maybe you're working with that person. Maybe you're on the radio in that area. Maybe you're part of the media. Maybe you are at their church. Maybe you're in their knitting club. So the more libertarians, voluntarists, liberty-living anarchists there are per capita, the more influence you have. And what we've ended up seeing is that the libertarians in New Hampshire are forced to be reckoned with. We had in 2012, and this is you know seven years ago or whatever, in 2012, a state representative from Keene said that the free staters are the single greatest threat to the state. That's a badge of honor to have someone in the political system say that about libertarians. Libertarians aren't a threat anywhere except in New Hampshire. In everywhere else, you get ignored. The media doesn't care about libertarians. And why should they? You don't have an impact. There's no real threat. There's no likelihood that you're going to win. So they ignore you. But in New Hampshire, we can't be ignored. Um, in New Hampshire, they pay close attention to what we do. In New Hampshire, when we do something, when we say something, reporters talk about it. It gets coverage in the mainstream media. It gets on the radio. So, like, we're having a real impact, and it's still early on in this whole process. Yeah, the Free State Project has been around since 2001, so we're coming up on 20 years, but politics doesn't change quickly. If we want to accelerate that process, we've got to move people together. Libertarians need to get out from behind their computer screens and get into real life and start doing real activism on the ground in real life that makes a difference. You can argue with libertarians all day long on Facebook and these other platforms, and you're not making any kind of impact. You're not changing their minds, you're not doing anything except spinning your wheels. Are you talking so, about libertarians arguing with other libertarians or libertarians anyone, arguing with status? Both. Libertarians love arguing with each other or arguing with status online. You're wasting your time. So I would suggest moving to New Hampshire. If, you're, if you think it's too cold, well, just give up, you know, because what's the point? I mean, I don't want to be that much of a uh, step in the mud, a Debbie Downer in that case, but man. I mean, it's frustrating to be a libertarian anywhere else but New Hampshire, where we can actually make a difference, where we're actually making an impact. Otherwise, you know, move to Acapulco and you know, take it easy for the rest of your life. Why bother? Because if you're not actually making a difference, if you're not making an impact, then what's the point? Exactly. And uh, I think it also kind of reminds me of the Icelandic Pirate Party, where they came out in Parliament and said, oh, well, the Icelandic Pirate Party, they only got 16%. It's like, 16%? That's huge. And that was their first election. Right when they got the 16 or 19 percent or whatever it was, that was their first time out. That's incredible for uh, as far as results are concerned. Yeah, so what I see is that the Libertarian Party just has a very bad marketing. I mean, if we can't compete with you know, the Republicans and the Democrats, it's just this mind fog of you know I'm a guy that's very well read, but in 2008 when I graduated, I didn't even know the Libertarian Party existed. Never heard that word. Went to a liberal arts school where they just, I mean, I knew all that was crap, but, you know, if someone like me didn't even know it existed, and then finally, you know, I discovered uh, Hubert Griffin, who then discovered Ron Paul and all of this, and then now I'm here rooming with Ernest Hancock, and so it's funny how the world, you know, ends up working like that. But uh, I think most people are more libertarian than, than they even know, especially, you know, the message is, I don't want to tell you what to do, I don't want you to tell me what to do. At the point where you start doing something that interferes with me, then that's when, you know, we start having a problem. But just basically, just don't be a dick, you know, you have to the golden rule. And uh, in which Ron Paul did get booed for the golden rule in 2012 in South Carolina, I believe, where... At the debate, know, right? Yeah. 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 Um, the Libertarian Party's got a lot of problems. One of the facts, uh, one of, like you said, I resigned from the party in 2008 over frustrations of how it had strayed from principle. Because to me, that was what attracted me in the first place, was the non-aggression principle. Hey, it's not okay to use violence uh, to threaten people or to get your way. It's not okay. You know, we learned that in preschool. I mean, this is preschool level stuff that we're talking about here, right? And so when I did outreach in Florida, I had which is like master's level in college, so. But okay. so in Florida, when I did outreach for the Libertarian Party, we were doing like the world's smallest political quiz, where you give people the ten question quiz at uh, theadvocates.org and they fill it out and you give them a score. And you're right, many people are far more libertarian than they realize. Uh, they don't know what the word means. They still probably don't know what the word means because you got people like Gary Johnson going out there completely screwing it up and trying to act like he's a libertarian when he doesn't even talk about the non-aggression principle, which is the bedrock concept behind uh, libertarianism. So they've got a huge issue. There's such a small, small group. They're so, um, when you're looking for a candidate, right? So if you, if you're in the peanut area, right? Yes. Okay. Do you ever go to the Libertarian Party meetups there? Well, we have uh, Nick Sarwark is kind of... 
He's the chairman. Yeah, and I did go to, uh, I did talk with him once and kind of tried extending an olive branch to him and told him, uh, you know, kind of like the really short version of my story is I ended up, uh, you know, being really pissed off with Bill Weld in August, uh, like 2016. He said handguns are more dangerous than AR-15s. Yeah. I'm like, that is the final straw for me. So I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to go try to help get Trump elected. And I'm going to try to convince the military, not that he's the, not that he's, you know, we're arguing for which wrong track we're going to put us on, but, you know, Hillary, I just want to do everything I could to make sure her and Jeb Bush didn't win. So I was trying to convince libertarians to vote for Donald Trump. I ended up getting more post engagements. I got over half a million post engagements the week of the election. That's somebody, uh, and it was screw face, but that's somebody either liking it, commenting, or sharing. From a standstill August 27th, that's with nobody, far out to the Libertarian Party by myself. And I didn't come at it in this, you know, bravado way to Nick. I was very olive branch to pay. I know how to reach out to some of the people that voted for Trump. And he actually stopped me and said, Tim, we want nothing to do with anyone that even considers voting for Trump. So I don't care about anything you have to say. Basically, good day, sir. Goodbye. Wow. I mean, that's a total asshole thing to do. Um, it's unfortunate. And so when you're dealing with these libertarians, um, first of all, how many of them are there in your area that go to a meeting? Like, that would go to a, do you have any idea? Have you ever been to, like, a Phoenix area libertarian hangout, meet up, whatever? Well, the unofficial ones, and now we're getting some music here, so if I cut it soon, but the unofficial ones are going to be at Ernest Hancock's house, where, you know, it's not a Libertarian Party meetup, but there's way more people at that than if you go to the official ones. I did go to one where it was Adam Kokesh was there, and there was maybe 25, 30 people there, but it was, all, it was you know, I would say definitely junior high level organizational ship of, hey, I just drove, you know, an hour, spent time away from my family, you know, now it's, you know, three, four hours, we've accomplished absolutely nothing. No one, I was trying to reach out and, like, give the guy my name and didn't even want to write down my info or anything. And I'm like, this is just a waste a of time. And the other thing that I see is, uh, I feel like there's the Libertarian Party, all, and Nick, I will give Nick Sarwak credit for this. He says the party is who shows up, and if the people that show up are former leftists, then now the, the party is perceived as being leftists when there's people like me and there's people like you who want nothing to do with some of that infilt say infiltration because it's that's sort of the people at the top of the party don't represent everybody in the party. And there's a lot of people that are libertarian who aren't in the party that probably who are and that's I think not crazy. So the point I wanted to make about the numbers was, and it's, you kind of made the point as well, so who shows up is what matters. Usually who shows up at these party meetings, and you gave an example of where Adam Kokesh was there, so that's an atypical meeting, they had a guest speaker. I just mean like your hardcore, the ones that are coming to do the party business, that kind of, that kind of stuff. You got maybe, in most places, maybe 10. If you got 20, you got a big libertarian party in your area. Well, guess what? They're all super socially awkward. They're all like unable to communicate. They're just awful. And I'm not saying that all of them are that way, but that's kind of the bulk of the liberty movement. And so, well, guess what? It's time to run candidates. Who do you have to choose from? These 10 or 20 people. And so you get, if you don't have a large pool of people who are interested from which to choose your candidate, guess who your candidates are going to be? It's going to be these people who can barely use a microphone. They don't know how to make eye contact. They don't know how to speak to an interviewer. So even if they did get media coverage, which they don't get, but even if they did, they botch it up. I mean, it's just an absolute mess, which is why numbers matter, right? So in the in New Hampshire, we've got a couple thousand people who knew. Most of them aren't working with the libertarians. They figured out it was actually a better idea to do what libertarians hate and infiltrate the other parties. So we've got a bunch of libertarians who've joined the Republicans. Some have joined the Democrats. And they're infiltrating those other parties and having way more political success. And we can get the best candidates running, the, the ones that are you know good at communicating, because we have enough people. So it's all about numbers. It's always, always been about numbers. You know? Wherever it is that you are, if you don't have enough people, and that is something I've struggled with. It's like, do I uh, go into the Republican Party to then help Rand Paul? Uh, you know, I mean, I you know keep kind of bouncing back and forth, sort of, a, I guess, a free agent of where I think I'm gonna, you know, f up the most amount of stuff or be able to get, uh, you know, what I want out. And I recently did just join the Libertarian Party again to try to. Uh, you like abuse. Part of the, the Mises, <laughs> as part of the Mises caucus, but you know I've got Nick Starwick in my hometown. You know a guy like me who's reaching out and saying, "Hey, I want to give you free help." Of I reached more, uh, you know, I reached about five million people the two, three months leading up to the election as a nobody, and then before I got shadow banned completely. But you know that tiny slice of pie, I, tiny slice of time, I had an impact. 
and he basically said, you know, F off. And here's a guy in my own city, and then he comes around to go running for Phoenix Council, and he gets some of that, you know, Phil Wealth type money of, here's $100,000, and I think he got fourth or fifth in a mayor race. So here he is, you know, you know, it's pathetic. And what was the what was the quote that he had where it had something to do with uh, somebody had a quote uh, from I think it was Rothbard. He's like, oh well, Rothbard, you know, he didn't know how to. He's the worst person you want to follow. And uh, basically, what could be social? I'm sure if you saw the Twitter thing. From, from I pay no attention. I pay no attention to the uh, the ongoing drama within the uh, the libertarian movement. I quit Facebook over a year ago. I've got so much going on in New Hampshire as far as activism is concerned. I don't have time for this crap. You know, That's what these other libertarians have time for. Because they're not doing real activism. They're not actually out doing anything that's meaningful. Oh, every four years they're going to run a candidate. Great. What would you get? 2%? 3%? Uh, pathetic. You know, you mentioned running for mayor in, uh, in New Hampshire. We had a guy who moved to Keene. Um, his name's Bob Paul. He's a great, you know, pro-liberty volunteerist guy. He's um, you know, a little socially awkward, but he was willing to run, and he did. And he kind of, you know, broke out of his shell, and it was a growing experience for him. And he got 30% um, first time out with, you know, basically no budget and no campaigning. He didn't really do much of anything except respond to whatever media inquiries we had. In a lot of cases in New Hampshire, it's even in Keene, which is like a, a terrible place to run as a libertarian because it's one of the most established kind of liberal uh, locations. But, you know, even there, we're the opposition. Like, the Republicans don't even exist in Keene. Now, that's not true in the rest of New Hampshire, but the Republican Party's been so decimated in Keene, um, this last year they had one candidate on the ballot. Now, the Libertarians have since lost ballot access, which they gained in 2016 out of, I think, a fluke, because my theory is it was Trump and Hillary, people hated them so much, they were like, I'm going to vote those Libertarians, even though it was Gary Johnson. Like, I want to vote someone who's not Trump and Hillary, so... And then Nick gets to take a you know, victory lap and look at how much we increased it and like you know you got two piles of turd running against each other and you know you want to take all the credit for this yeah it could have been a monkey and uh it would have done as well as uh, maybe better than gary johnson so they could have run anyone i don't know if you're allowed to say monkey nowadays with uh all the political correctness but this is the one place no, i mean a shit throwing monkey it could have been something like that and it would have done just as well if not as better because people didn't want to vote for trump and hillary so the libertarians in new hampshire the governor candidate who was you know kind of milk toast and not that you know not that great he got more than 4%, which got the Libertarians' ballot access at the same level of the Republicans and Democrats in New Hampshire, which is not easy to do. Um, it was not easy to do, but they did it, and it was the first time they did it within 20 years, so that kind of gave a little bit of a boost to the Libertarian Party. In 2018, they had a lot more candidates on the ballot. Unfortunately, their gubernatorial candidate, who was honestly a better candidate than the one in 2016, didn't do as well. So it went from they got 4% in 2016 down to 1.6% in 2018. So there was no growth. There was nothing whatsoever. And so at this point, I've actually, um, I'm still a member of the Libertarian Party of New Hampshire. I'm not a member of the National Party. I haven't been for more than a decade. And um, I, uh, I joined the Republicans at this point. I've been a part of the Democrats before in New Hampshire, but I've never actually gotten involved with their party politics. So I've actually been going to the Republican meetings now. And you know what? I've been pleasantly surprised that they've been welcoming. We even have a uh, transsexual libertarian who ran for uh, sheriff in Keene. This uh, in 20, uh, 2018, she's come to one of the Republican meetups. I'm like, all right, how are the Republicans going to treat this obvious transsexual? And they were welcoming towards her, which was, you know, refreshing. But of course, the Republicans, um, at least in my area, are old. They're uh, 60, 65, 70 years old. It's all older people. There's almost no younger people in there. So it's like, if you wanted to take over the Republican Party in Keene, New Hampshire, it would be relatively easy to do. So, um, you know, let's go ahead and do that. Let's take over these old parties, because that's what pisses, that's what upset me about one of the reasons why I left the Libertarian Party, was there was too many of these Republicans coming in, watering down the message, and ruining the principles of the party. Well, all right, let's bring our principles into these old parties, the Republicans and Democrats, which are both gray, both getting older. The Republicans have an even worse problem with that than the Democrats do. It's an opportunity, because in New Hampshire, everything's small. All the cities are small. Manchester's only 100,000 people. If you want to have an impact, go to where it's already a small place. What's Phoenix? A million? You know, how many people live in Phoenix? I think it's actually like, like three to four million. I mean, and when we, get, and we get 20 people with a big name like Adam Kokesh. So it takes 
So when you're in uh, Keene, for instance, has been described as a fishbowl. Um, this was uh, by Garrett Ian, who is a New Hampshire native who lived in Keene for a while, the returning activist, um, where it's basically a stage. You come there, you get active, well, everybody's going to know who you are. It's a small town. Everybody knows everybody. You know, you talk to somebody on the street, you stand on the street in Keene for an hour, or you sit out at, you know, if it's summertime, because you won't want to do this during the winter. But if it's, uh, you know, if we're sitting out during the summer on uh, you know, eating at Local Burger, we just paid in cryptocurrency, by the way, inside Local Burger, we're sitting out there, I'm going to guarantee you three people will pass by who I know. Well, I'll just say hello to, just because it's that kind of place. You know, everybody knows everybody else. So you have a disproportionately large impact in a place like that. You become more important. The libertarians become a threat to the system, and uh, that's why we push back. That's why people hate us. Libertarians aren't hated anywhere because they're pointless. Roger Stone once said, you only hate me because I'm effective. Like, basically, I revel in your hatred. And actually, I believe the last kind of major show that he did was just right over there, maybe 100 yards. Yep. Danny says with a crypto... Uh, crypto show where they had uh, G. Edward Griffin, Lynn Albrook, uh, Roger Stone, and and then Roger Stone got uh, gagged right after that. So Roger Stone got gagged about two days ago. I heard. So now Danny's one of the last interviews. But for the person that's out there, you know, everyone thinks that they have to be perfect or they have to be, you know, I've, I've, you're like one of the first people I've interviewed. I haven't done tons of interviews, but you have to kind of break out through your shell and maybe you start, you know, no one starts with, oh, I'm this perfect, amazing interview. I'm this, you know, everything is perfect. So you just start small and keep getting better and better and better. Uh, you know, I, public speaking used to be my greatest fear. And then here I am now with now you're on stage. 200 people and I didn't bother me one bit. And so, you have to get out there, you have to be active, and you get other people that want to say, hey, well, you know, if, you know, if my way of life gets destroyed, I'm going to be there and I'll have my guns to fight the government. You know, if you're not, if you don't have the balls to get involved right now in the information war and have conversations, do you think you're going to get involved, like, in this all-out war that's going on? And to some, some degrees, it's actually tougher to do sort of like what you're doing than it is to go over to Afghanistan, because there's less people doing what you're doing from a... Uh, just going against the grain and going against, you know, the, the, the popular opinion is a lot of times, you know, the social ramifications that's even more difficult than going and, you know, strapping on, you know, a gun and heading over to overseas. Well, I'm not going to say it's uh, more dangerous, but uh, I will say that people, um, they are afraid of what others think. Right. You know, there is social pressure. Uh, oh, will I lose my job? I mean, you've been through something like this as well, where being true to yourself lost you your, your career. Or what well, was your career? Send me, you send me back a year. But yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, so, but ultimately it ended up working out for you. Being true to yourself always does. Harry Brown, actually, the libertarian presidential candidate in 1996 and 2000, um, wrote a book. Actually, he did a. Um, he used to be like a, an investment advisor back in the day, and back in like the 70s. And he had a, um, a course that he wrote and presented, an audio course called Rule Your World. And it's like a multi-cassette tape. I had it on cassette quite a long time ago. Um, he had, the, had this thing. Anyway, he came up with uh, one of the parts of this was his silver rule. Everybody knows the golden rule, right? Like, treat others as you want to be treated. So Harry Brown's silver rule was... Or that, whoever has the gold makes the rules. That's, that's my grandpa's. That's another version. Um, but uh, the silver rule is that if you are true to yourself, then you will attract into your life the people who are the right people. Because if you are not being true to yourself, then you're living your life for someone else. If you're living your life the way that you are expected to, or the way that somebody else who's important wants you to, then you're not being you. You're not really actually emanating whatever, you know, vibrations or words or the things that you know are really you that represent who you really are and when you start to do that then your experience starts to change you start to you will see people like Nick Sarwark leave your life and you will see people who are you know Bernie Hancock come into your life right like you see the right people the right people are attracted to you that's the silver rule it's just so important but there there's a fear that people have around that because it can lead to some tough circumstances loss of a job loss of a girlfriend loss of you know, other things that people are they feel are important. So I don't blame someone for wanting to conform, but it's not my road, it's not my path, and if you really want to have the life that you, you know, you were meant to have, then you've got to create it. And the only way you can do that is by being true to yourself and being open about those things. I, I couldn't agree anymore. And since I do hang out with Ernest Hancock quite a bit, who's actually just right over there, 
Uh, I always mention as I'm introducing him to other people, I, I mentioned that he was, you know, the second radio show host in America, so interviewing all the crypto guys, and I always reference yourself as you were, it, my, I hope that this is right, but are, were you like the first guy to interview like Roger, Roger Beer, but one of the crypto guys where you're, you know, starting to make this like an actual thing, or no, bro, Roger Beer found out about Bitcoin from your show, I believe. Mean, is, that, is that the story? So the, the short version is uh, we, you know, we've been doing Free Talk Live for a long time, and uh, we were always, we still are, the big libertarian talk show on the radio. So Roger had found us as a listener, and uh, he at the, at the time was a successful man. I mean, Roger was a business owner. He owned a, a memory dealers. manufacturer called Memory Dealers. I think he still does, um, out in Tokyo. And uh, so this is like a wholesaler for a computer brand. Anyway, they um, Roger had decided he wanted to advertise with Free Talk Live, even though you know, he's advertising like wholesale level stuff. The odds that he's ever going to get a client from, you know, the average radio listener pretty slim. So it wasn't a good advertising choice, but he did it because he wanted to support what we were doing as libertarians on the radio. So he was already our advertiser and listener. And so he heard us talking about Bitcoin one night and uh, we hadn't caught the vision for it. Like we were just talking about it in the news. I don't know if it was Silk Road or or uh, ten thousand Bitcoin for a pizza. Maybe. I don't think it was that. I think um, actually, I think Mark told me uh, Je Je Jeremy West, who's a listener of ours, had called in about it. Um, he's an Australian, or actually an American living in Australia. Anyway, he was telling us about it or something. It was for whatever reason it was being discussed. And uh, Roger heard us talking about it, and he caught the vision. Like he saw, this is a way to defeat the state, to take power out of the hands of governments and banks and put it in the hands of the people, which is an incredible paradigm shift, right? Like, he saw that paradigm shift, and that's when he decided to buy a bunch of it. Like, I think he spent, like, $50,000 or something like that buying Bitcoin for probably less than a dollar a piece or thereabouts. And, uh, and so he was the one who, he found Bitcoin through us, and because of that, he bought a bunch of it, and then eventually he said to us, I want to keep advertising with you, but I want you to take Bitcoin for the advertising money. And at that point, I'm like, I don't know. And so, like, we took 10% in Bitcoin and then moved up to, like, 25% and then 50% and then eventually finally took it. So if we'd only taken the 100% up front, we would be so much more uh, Bitcoin holders than we currently are. But nonetheless, he, he basically dragged us in. Uh, and thank goodness he did, because here we are. And that is very interesting because I didn't know the backstory on that. So he found out about it for you, and then he then it was the one that. Yeah. yeah, that was an amazing <laughs> story. But we really do appreciate your time today. I know you've been talking all all day, to, to, or all week to people. Yeah. You you've, you've been here for like a week and a half already, or two weeks. Or... Yeah, I got the pleasure of uh, staying a little longer this time. Last time, last year and the year before that, just came down just for the conference and left right after. And I will be leaving tomorrow or Monday, so right after the conference. So, but I got to stay for a week in advance, just to kind of explore Acapulco a little bit. And, uh, it's been nice. All right. Well, thank you for hanging in. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. All right. Super. Appreciate it. Why would anybody want to buy Bitcoin inside their IRA? I mean, the whole point of Bitcoin was to have peer-to-peer electronic cash. So why are you going to have a financial intermediary buy Bitcoin for you? Why don't you just cash out your 401k, cash out your IRA, cash out your retirement plan, and just buy Bitcoin on your own? Well, the reason for that is if somebody had January 1st, 2017, invested $100,000 into Bitcoin, and then one year later, they would have had after taxes and the 10% penalty, they would have just under $900,000. So you would have turned 100,000 into close to 900,000. So you're obviously doing something right. However, there is a better way that they could have done it. What they could have done is they could have done a Roth conversion. With the Roth conversion, you save the 10% penalty, so you've got 10% more that could be invested into crypto. And the beauty of this is that now all of your gains are now forever tax-free. So you put the $100,000 in, and now, again, you're getting out of paying the 10% penalty, and now after even all my management fees, you now have a little over a million dollars. We have all the exact specific numbers linked down uh, or should be on the screen right now. I don't have it memorized, but you know, to me, you know, a million dollars sounds a little bit better than nine hundred thousand dollars. And having tax-free gains forever sounds better than having nine hundred thousand dollars that now any appreciation or 
hopeful potential appreciation would then be subject to tax. And the other reason why we thought of this, or really the genesis of this, is I had heard a lot of people doing this, and I thought that, hey, there's got to be a better way. But the main reason is you've got a lot of people who the only money they have to invest is inside of their retirement accounts. A lot of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. I mean, even people who have million dollar IRAs, a lot of them don't have actual extra money to invest. They don't have rainy day funds. And the rainy day funds should be kept in actual safe, uh, liquid, you know, basically cash or really short term treasury bills. It shouldn't be invested into Bitcoin. And so a lot of people just don't have that extra money to invest. And so taking a small percentage of your IRA or 401k and then, you know, putting it into Bitcoin, if you know what you're doing and you understand the risk and you actually believe in this philosophically, is actually, I think, you know, a good move to make. So again, if you're going to pull money out of your 401k to buy Bitcoin, you should talk to myself because I think that the Roth IRA conversion is a much better way of doing things. And that is why somebody would want to consider having Bitcoin inside their IRA as opposed, as opposed to cashing out their 401k and just buying it outright. Thank you for listening to the show. One of the ways you can help support the show is by seeing if it makes sense to invest with myself. I'm a certified financial planner with Innovative Advisory Group, LLC. Innovative specializes in self-directed IRAs where you can invest into virtually anything including virtual assets and cryptocurrencies inside your retirement accounts. And get this, you can actually hold on to the private key. And that's something that nobody else is doing, at least with the help of an advisor. We also run protective growth portfolios where you invest a small amount of your portfolio into put options and while the rest, and that basically helps protect the rest of the portfolio. Not very many people are familiar with put options, but a lot of people are familiar with homeowners insurance and it works in a very similar fashion. So essentially what you're doing is using a very, very small percentage of uh, basically, you know, the value of the home to protect the rest of the home. And if the house doesn't burn down or there isn't a major catastrophe, then you're basically out on the, the uh, cost of the insurance. Flip side on, uh, you know, if your house ends up burning down, well then you build your house back. And that's really the same thing that's going on here. So if the market ends up tanking, and we know the most that you, that you can possibly lose on your investment. And honestly, if the market were to go down 60, 70%, uh, and you're only down single digits potentially, then that's an amazing buying opportunity. Lord Nathan Rothschild said it best that the best time to invest is when there's blood in the streets. But if your money goes down with everybody else's, then you're not able to take advantage of the next crisis. And also, if you're just camping out in cash or in bonds, making next to nothing, you could be going broke safely for a very long time. And then you've got to know when to time the market. And that's something that basically nobody can do. Uh, now, on the flip side, if I'm wrong in all this and the market keeps going higher or the Federal Reserve comes out or the European Central Bank comes out and says, hey, we're going to print a whole bunch more money and the market goes to infinity, well, then you'll go up to infinity minus the cost of that put option. So I think that this is a great strategy that you definitely want to learn more about. I mean, just given the craziness that's going on right now, uh, I mean, if you're heavy into cash right now, heavy into bonds or even heavy into stocks, especially if you're close to actually needing those funds for retirement or just needing those funds in general, maybe for a big project or maybe you work on a crypto and you raised a whole bunch of money, that this is something that we can help protect yourself and protect your loved ones. And there's really, there's nothing you have to lose by scheduling a free consultation with us. And actually there's a chance you could lose a lot by not talking with us in general. If you go and click on our website in the upper right hand corner, there's a work with Tim button up there. You can see all of our plans, ways we work with our clients, pricing can all be found there. And given that I'm sort of out there on a lot of different political issues, I know that I'm not gonna be for everybody. You know, that's uh, sort of my way of uh, qualifying you, not the other way around, but you know, I'm fine. I'm not trying to have all six, pe six billion people out there like me. And I'm um, here to really at the end of the day to tell the truth and to make money, not necessarily make friends. So head over to thelibertyadvisor.com and let's see what we can do for you. Thank you.